Welcome to Blue Grit Radio, the podcast that explores making better cops for a better community. I'm your host, Eric Tong. I've been an active police officer since 2007. We will dive into the aspects of police culture, health and wellness, leadership, and mindset. You'll hear from experts, not only from policing, but all industries as they relate to being our best with purpose, passion, and positivity. Join me as we share stories, lessons, and advice so we can all be better for ourselves, our teams, our families, and our communities. All right, all right. So welcome back to Blue Grit Radio. This is your host, Eric, and today I'm joined by Mark and Seb, Mark Bouchard, Seb Lavoie. How was that pronunciation? I was perfect. I, I took Spanish in high school, so <laughs> Close I'm enough. proud of myself. Uh, yeah, guys. So two returning guests that have known each other much, much longer than I've known either of them. A little reunion. Of sorts. Yeah, it's great to be on with you, Seb. Thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, man. Awesome to see you. You too. I'm glad to be back, Eric. Good to have you, man. I feel very privileged, but uh, a lot of the nexus of this for the listeners, I know we have some international listeners, but a lot of domestic listeners, but both of these gents are from the true north and they work together, but intersected with each of you from different angles, right? Got connected with Mark initially and then got introduced to the collective guys and then Seb's a, a regular on the collective working projects. And maybe we'll even talk about that, you know, with Mark putting out his book. Mark, plug your book real quick. <laughs> oh, setting My Sights on Stigma, Thoughts from an Injured Mind. You can find it on Amazon. It's the book I needed as a young man and a new cop. It's what I wish they taught all of us as new cops. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And we truly are best suited to help our younger, prior versions of ourselves. And so there's a lot of you that we think of front of mind. And there's a lot of us that we, we see ourselves in, you know, a lot of you that tune in and have the conversations and our, our future leaders. And little side note, I do think that all of us, you know, we're relatively obsolete and really not the focal point. It's the the generations coming up, the generations coming in, like y'all are going to be doing the really amazing, fantastic things. And hopefully we can just further the conversation for all those things, whether it's wellness, leadership, culture, those are all deeply intersected. And I would even argue in a lot of ways, the same exact freaking thing. Just to add to the point you made uh, on the previous point here, which I think was incredibly powerful, is that wellness is a preemptive action not a let's wait until something goes wrong and now address it. That's the way that we generally address it. Wellness is an afterthought. Whereas if I said this to your, and I correlated it to your physical capabilities to do the work, for example, you'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I need to be in shape for this. Well, you also need to have your wellness mechanisms put in place <laughs> before you start. Because mm -hmm. once you start getting wrapped up in these events that are going to unfold and lead to certain potential dark holes, you need to have that dialed in before this happens. Because Otherwise, you'll be in a, in a more emotionally sort of volatile situation, and, and it's going to be a lot harder to, to use a little bit more stoicism in, in your approach, right? Which is very beneficial. 100%. I'll echo that, Seb. I love what you just said about a preemptive wellness model. Like I think so much and for so long, we've been focused on a disease model. How do we have the right crisis intervention line so someone doesn't die from a suicide? And the answer isn't that. Don't get me wrong. We should have intervention too. But the answer is wellness. The answer, like when you read a book like, Police Suicide Epidemic in Blue from John Violante. Education ahead of time. It's like have people like us, like with all the messages that we each are spreading in our own ways, go and tell that recruit in training. Here's the challenges you might face. Here's healthy ways of dealing with the problems you'll face so that you never end up in that place. And so that your, you know, your relationships stay together. You have a good relationship with your kids. So you can be a healthy person. And believing that that's an actual realistic outcome instead of just cram it in the trash can and wait until the wheels fall off. And I think we're, we're shifting that mental model. It just, it takes years to keep changing it. And the more we can keep spreading that message, the more we can actually get it to happen. There's such an array in what agencies, organizations are doing and kudos to the agencies are on, that are on the forefront. And I won't even say my agency, right? We have a lot of work to do and I'm proud of the work we're doing and those that are helping in that effort. But there's agencies that are quote unquote doing a great job but you could argue that it's all rehab, right? It's all after the fact, reactive, responsive. It's uh, critical incident stress management, which is after an incident, you know, categorically, basically all the time. Literal PT, like physical therapy rehab for officers that get hurt. But if we talk about people being able to do the job that they need to do mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, like what practices are we initiating? What support mechanisms are we building 
in the culture, integrated in the culture, right? So you're talking about the young, the young guys and gals, so that that doesn't happen, or it is way less likely to, right? So the prehab aspect, I love that we're talking about this. And I feel like it's crazy, because I was literally pondering on my drive today, this notion of treating the disease versus the symptoms. And we got to do both. Earlier in my little spiel just now, I'm saying that agencies are doing a really good job if they're treating the symptoms, but that just tells us how much further we need to go, right? We're only scratching the surface if that's our our main goal, if that's our main discussion point. Yeah. I mean, the problem is fundamentally, we're doing nothing about it. So anything that anyone can do in an organized fashion should be applauded and should be, you know, respected. But it's that's not the baseline. You know, if your baseline is zero, one seems like a lot. But where we need to go is 100, right? And so if we hit 20, it's theoretically 20 times better than the, you know, the, the people at the, at, the, at the foundational level. But guess what? It doesn't make it any better, right? And so that is the piece that's critical. It's like, how do we get an agency or how do we get an organization or people even? If you say organization and if you say an outfit or whatever the case may be, then it absolves everybody mm. from responsibility over this, where, yeah. which is not what we're after because everybody has a say when it comes to wellness. But it would be really interesting to focus on the individuals, focus on the organizations and make sure that we do it preemptively. And so when people are interested in coming to policing or when they start engaging in a training program, so if you want to wait a little bit further past the recruiting phase, where they definitely should be told, listen, you should be reading The Emotional Survival of Law Enforcement Officer or Mark's book or whatever the case may be in, a, in an approved library where people start toying with those concepts, even in the recruiting process. Then you roll them straight into your training, you know, your academy and your training curriculum. And now you have built in mechanisms and every day, not like, oh, we give them 30 hours. No, by the time of a, a 600 hour program concludes, a fourth or a fifth of that time should have been spent preemptively teaching them all the coping mechanisms and things that they can do to alleviate certain issues and how to react to certain issues and what to expect in the, in the context of an investigation and all of those things to give them so that when it happens, it doesn't hit them like it, they never got punched before. You know, the punch you prepare for is a lot better than the punch you're completely unprepared. For. I mean, take any mm -hmm. UFC fighters and jump them at Walmart, you know, <laughs> see what happens from behind. Once they know they have a fight on their hands, they have to walk inside that cage. There's a training camp and there's some stuff put in place and all this good stuff. Now they can go in there and do the fighting with the optimized sort of uh, conditions. Whereas if you said, okay, you're a UFC fighter, but at some point this year, we'll, you'll get jumped from somewhere and you'll have to react appropriately. I mean, that, that would be ridiculous to state something like this, but yet here we are. Here we are, which no, is a real no, thing. <laughs> exactly. You know, either. Exactly. It's a different thing when it's real. <laughs> totally. Sam, you said a bunch of stuff I love, mm -hmm. honestly. Uh, you talked about even like basically setting the culture, having culture. One of the things you mentioned is reading. I don't understand how emotional survival is not in the curriculum of every police organization. We want to increase retention. We want to decrease off-duty sick time. We want to have healthy people. Then let's teach them what Gil Martin put together. 20 years ago, it's still all relevant. Absolutely. I actually remember a time on the teams, I was joking and, and teasing one of the guys about being a bit of a nerd for reading. It was Warren. And <laughs> you stood up for him being like, man, all you guys should read. And I was doing it jokingly <laughs> because like, I read every book in our library there. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge reader and I actually like, I admire Warren. He, he's a big reader too. He's he, a super smart dude. That's the kind of culture we want to set. But it's mm -hmm. honestly what you also were describing to me, it's like how to pass on wisdom, right? And how to have people be ready for what they're going to face. Grossman has a term he uses called pre-battle veterans. How do we teach people what they need to know so they're ready? Because when you look at the guys who've really been through it a bunch of times, they stay calm under stress. They make good decisions, right? How do we pass that wisdom on so that you're ready for that the first time or you're more ready? Mm -hmm. And to me, that is setting the culture. That is when people like each of you keep spreading the right messages of, hey, guys, here's what I learned. Here's what I wish I knew. And here's a little piece of wisdom I want to try and pass on because I want to help spread it to you. Yeah, you're indoctrinating that, right? And that's, it's reps. And if you don't have the personal reps, then you get the experiential wisdom from others that have been through that, right? Like, learn from my mistakes, not your own. Just like the first time we run code, we call it like license siren, right? I remember the first time, first few times, right? Especially when I didn't have a trainer with me, 
head was about to jump through the top of the car my heart too right and i'm just so amped up and afterwards all said and done you get you end the chase my hands like shaking and i'm just so jacked up and excited right whereas especially working canine and responding to different counties and just being on the freeway for just running code for you know 30 minutes you just listen to the sirens and you're just kind of swerving around cars you're driving one-handed you're kind of looking out the window you're like i wish there's something else to listen to other than the siren you know and you can barely hear your radio traffic and you're just like bored you're just waiting to get where you're going there's no rise out of it right because you had the reps but absent that you got to look at it and train your brain and try to process through what that would look like. We're good in the culture looking at tactical situations that we haven't been in and watching body cam. That's an awesome free resource. Talk it through with your team. But we can apply that same notion to, hey, when I go through my period of burnout later in this career and I'm at odds with my partner and my family life is feeling like I, I don't even know how to express myself, man, I'm going to think about the senior officer back in the day that said, this is what helped him. I'm going to think about this sergeant that said, this is what helped her. And because it worked for them, I'm going to give it a shot, right? I'm going to check my ego and think about it and be honest with myself. Yeah, exactly. It's it's kind of like it, the way I like to, or the analogy I like to make with the leadership piece is essentially as a leader, I have a drill and you have a bucket and life operations, everything gets in that bucket. Like there's no discrimination there. It'll come from everywhere in your life and it fills that bucket up. My job is to try to poke as many holes in that bucket as I can so that the water doesn't fill the bucket and overflow. And so that could be any, you know, unnecessary administrative stress. Is there a way that we can streamline that, that we can take some of the stress of our people? There's operational requirements. Well, are we going to take on more mandated items and just say yes to everything because I want a promotion? Or are we going to look at how we're going to manage the work, like all of those things. So as I'm making those strategic decisions for the people, you're poking a hole, poking another one, poking another one. And now when it happens, it's not just so much about the preparation and how much preparation they preemptively done, but it's the fact that they're carrying a lower amount of stress generally on the day to day. And that's something that's sometimes forgotten. It's not only forgotten, but man, what you just said, and there's probably a lot of people that are going to be nodding their heads right now, but how many leaders are pouring water into the bucket? I mean, organizational <laughs> stress is one of the biggest ranking stressors for people or for first responders. That could probably go into the private sector too, right? Like a bad boss and how toxic that is to your lifestyle and your psyche. And there might even be leaders that are taping up the holes that other people are trying to drill or that you're, you know, the, the person's trying to drill themselves. It's like you're pouring water and then you're dunking the whole bucket into like the lake. That's the kind of boss some people are. I'm sure someone thinks that about me, so I'll just I'll just stop right there. Are you acting in a way that's conducive to that? Because I would I would challenge that big time. <laughs> I put pressure on people that need pressure, you know, because we got a job to do and we have addressing standards performance and, isn't yeah. isn't you know taping the holes. Yeah, addressing yeah, yeah. performance is something that we also responsible for because ultimately, guess what? When somebody is not performing the level at which they should be performing in the context of a team, who pays for that? Everybody else's wellness. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that, you know, looking at them and say, well, what can I do for them? And now you have a bigger, obviously, you know, all of this, but you know what I mean? Like we're, we're looking at a bigger picture now. We're looking at somebody that potentially has the potential to, you know, inflict more stress upon the rest of the peers and the culture and the organization. And so, yeah, definitely that needs to be done. It's not about being friends with everybody, but having that right amount of emotional intelligence and the understanding that what we do as leaders matters and it can have catastrophic consequences if it's not done correctly. I think that's balancing accountability and support. Mm -hmm. Like having worked on your team. So for anyone who doesn't know, like I was on Seb's team when he was a TL. So he would have been the sergeant. We would have had a corporal in between us. I live 600 kilometers away. So for you in the US, that's like 400 miles from my work. So I would commute to work and Seb was super supportive. I had a young son going long distances and I got moved to blue team because they needed a medic, but I got brought over because the team needed that. But then I needed some support from my leadership where, Hey man, maybe you can bank some overtime, take a day off. Like I remember feeling very supported, which then helps me to contribute to the team. But feeling supported is very different from like having low standards, which we owe that accountability to the team. That's something we do for the team. That's a leader's responsibility. And we're not doing anyone any favors. I actually saw something from Jocko recently that I loved where his way is like, it's dealing with it, but being compassionate. So you come at it like, hey, man, I noticed like, you know, you failed your quals, you missed all your shots. Like, what's going on? Is anything going on at, like I can support you with? Instead of coming at it like, hey, man, you screwed up. Like, if you do that one more time, you're off the team. Totally different mindset. You're going to have a way different result. 
And it's just a different way of looking at it. I literally just heard a neighboring agency police leader say that your support should be proportional to your expectations, right? And this is a leader that said, hey, I have high expectations, but my support better match up to that, well, literally to support it, but to allow for it, right? To foster that. And I think that's a perfect way to summarize what you're just saying, right? We need to support our people because they are our greatest asset, especially in the last few years that's been proven, right? Like if you don't have anyone to do the job, how are you going to accomplish the mission? So support them, right? Like you don't want to redline all the cars or you're not going to get across the finish line. It's pretty simple, but we have to explain it and keep explaining it in different ways for some reason. Yeah. I mean, I, I love everything about this essentially fact finding phase because that's one of the hardest things to do as a human being when you hear, you know, somebody speak to, to something or someone else, for example, or if you hear something, how somebody performs something or how they conduct themselves or whatever the case may be. Anytime something has the potential to elicit an emotional reaction in you, your first reaction shouldn't be, let me talk to this person. Your first reaction should be, let me find out what actually happened. And it's really interesting because we're cops and we've been cops long enough to know that just Generally, where's the truth, right? There's one side, the other side, and somewhere in the middle, if mm -hmm. you're lucky. And we know that. And yet we still will have emotional sort of negligent discharge when it comes to dealing with situations that we are personally engaged in simply because we're passionate about the work, we're passionate about what we're doing, and we're wanting the best for everybody. But sometimes taking a pause, like a tactical pause almost, and, and really reel it in and then sort of address it from a place of compassion or address it from a place of concern or whatever the case may be, and then deal with whatever comes out. But you'll be absolutely shocked with what people will tell you. And the bottom line is if somebody's not performing the way they should at work, it might be because, you know, they're going through a divorce or whatever the case may be, and you want to know if at all possible so that you can support them. And yes, you don't have to tell me anything you don't want to tell me, but I would love to support you. So if you, you know, if it's something that you need, I'm here for you. You know, let's have that conversation. It's tough, man, when it happens, especially if you get a little bit worked up, you know, ooh, I've already addressed this before, and this could be completely unrelated, and you're already formulated your response. And when else do we do that? Well, I'll tell you, if you do that in your head as you are heading to a call, what happens? It makes it very difficult for you to de-escalate the call or to adapt to what you're actually seeing because you've already preemptively decided what course of action you were going to take instead of let me feed off what's happening and make the right decision in light of the totality of the circumstances. That's no different. It's exactly the same. If you prime yourself for war, you're going to address the conversation like a warrior, but not a strategic one. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's get into that because you know oftentimes we I mentioned it in this episode but we got to train our brain and for a lot of the younger cops like they recognize that is their exposure to different things and a lot of senior officers would say yeah I mean we watch videos and when you get that call you have to be ready for the worst so how do you recognize that and toggle appropriately how do you effectively teach people to quickly operate their dimmer switch to the right intensity ultimately Imagine if you operated in or reacted to situation with the worst case scenario as the ultimate course of action, right? So it's important to understand that the worst case scenario doesn't go away because I don't give it thoughts. Obviously, I'm going to think about it. It's not about not thinking about it. Just like just like it's not about just like stoicism isn't about dis disregarding your emotions. It's about acknowledging them, putting them in a corner, and don't let don't let them run the show. So it's exactly the same. If you're heading somewhere, you're heading to a call, and you have you know all this information coming in. What information do I have, and what information am I making up? If we don't know X, Y, and Z, then don't assume X, Y, and Z. So it's like, what do I know at this time, and when I get up there? This is how I'm going to keep myself safe from a tactical standpoint and how I'm going to investigate what it is that I'm really dealing with, right? And then from there, you'll have added information, sensory you know, input and all this stuff coming from everywhere. Maybe you'll talk to other people. You'll be able to paint a clearer picture and you'll have a better idea. Now, that's not to say that if you get ambushed, obviously, you're going to do what you do and you're going to do your very best to fight through it. But if there is a way to control the amount of arousal that you're sending to your brain on a way to problem solving something, you're much more likely to problem solve it adequately and not fall in love with your own plan. That's a good point, Seb. When I had to go and redo our room clearing, like we called CQB or CQC uh, a couple years ago with a new package, and like I would be practicing my tactical breathing in the down room, like you're in between scenarios. Okay, what do you do to just lower your arousal, lower your stress? 
I do that when I drive. Like, okay, I got a long drive. Cool. I can do my breathing and I can show up with a heartbeat that's a bit lower. That'll help me to think more clearly. The biggest thing I try and think of, it's a saying I say to myself, is just play it as it lies, which to me is like a golf term. But it just means like, don't have a preconceived plan. You don't know what that person has or is going to do. So don't come in like thinking you do. You just rely on your instincts, your intuition, your training, and you'll make the right decision. But if you've already decided, that's when you like you're trying to put the the round peg in the square hole and you're going to cause yourself problems. I think also your intuition is usually going to be giving you cues of what's happening. You need to listen to it. I can think of times when like basically people are getting ready to fight. So they're grunting, they're growling, they're making all these noises, they're posturing. And what do a lot of like newer officers do sometimes? Like you're kind of scared. You just don't address it. Mm. Do the opposite. As soon as you see it, call that person. Hey man, you're making some fists over there. I'm getting really worried that you're looking like you want to fight me. And I'm really scared I'm going to have to hurt you. Is there anything I can say or do to get you to cooperate with me? And you will watch their posture change. I've I've been a couple times down in cells. Guys are getting ready to fight. And I will literally put my hand on them. Just be like, hey, man, you look like you're getting ready to fight. And I'm, I'm really afraid I'm going to have to really hurt you. And they go from being a predator to being prey. Their mm-hmm. body just like slumps. And all of a sudden, they get in the cell. And then they become tough. And now they lip you off. They got it, called out. Yeah. But if you actually just address it, and I think sometimes we're afraid to. We think it'll escalate it instead of just being willing listen to your intuition. You see the cues, address them early and you'll be better off in the long run. Sure. But what you just said, it's so good for today's policing age where most people have body cams, they have recording, right? We train our people to narrate what they're doing, sometimes what they're thinking, right? So to call out, because you only have one angle and let's face it, at least uh, I've, from my purview and experience, a lot of times when stuff goes downhill like the body cam falls off and it's just going to stare at the ceiling so you don't get the you know necessarily the whole view that you wanted but yeah you call that out and then it lets the the viewer know it lets the lay person that's going to try to judge you later know that you're factoring in these different things you're actually trying to de-escalate you're like hey man like is there anything i can do to have you like take a step down and it seems like you're getting really amped up and uh, anything I can do to kind of steer us a different direction. I think that's a great example. You know, you talk about intuition and some people might miss assign that to ignoring like your training, right? Because you're trained if this, then that, if this, then that. But it's no, like we need to key in on that survival instinct that's innate in us and then pay attention to it and then let that factor in with our decisions. Yeah, your intuition's a supercomputer, right? I know you guys have talked a bit about books. Anybody out there that wants to read a book, Gavin De Becker, uh, The Gift of Fear. That's basically what he says. It it finds the answers. It knows the answers. And we learn to just question it and not believe it. But usually it's right. And learn to just pick up. It Typically what it knows is not normal. It just goes, I know what normal is. I know what I'm used to seeing. Something has deviated from it. I can't often explain why. But I know that like, all of a sudden I have a heightened sense of danger. So again, I, I like to me, we should be teaching cops how to tap into their intuition. And I think we'd have better outcomes. Fear is a very interesting tool. You know, like if you're giving it too much power, you're not doing anything. If you're giving it not enough, you're not doing it correctly. I read The Gift of Fear, rather. Great book. It was probably two decades ago now. So, But, but I do remember it being a, being a great book. I think feeling is important and or how we are feeling about certain things doesn't always tell the picture about it. I'll give you an example of this. How many people have you met in your life that you did not like initially that became best friends, right? Yeah. And so there were underlying reasons that was the case. And generally it has something to do with you two are so alike. You, you don't like to have a mirror that, that, that push, pushes back on you the way you do, you know, and all of those things. And I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it because there's a million reasons that might, why that might happen. And so if I was to say to you, what was your first feeling about that person? You'd be, well, I actually didn't like him. Okay. But that was a symptomology of a bigger problem, you know, an insecurity of some sort that you're, you know, something that needed to be addressed within your confines. If you're fearful of everything, you know, let's call a spade a spade here. Policing is probably not the right job. You know, like there, there are a, lot, a ton of other things that you can do and mm-hmm. you can really grow into building some, some level of inoculation on, the, on some of those fears and really live a fulfilled life. But man, like, it's a rabbit hole that you have to be a little bit um, aware of, right? Like, yes, I am feeling this. There, mu- there ought to be a reason why that's the case. Let me pay attention. So it's not... The, the alternative to this is the fear comes on and I'm like, no, 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 stuff that I'm making stuff up. That's a different reaction than 
I'm fearful for whatever reason. I'm going to really be, be, you know, watching the hands, cutting my angles, doing the things as I need to be doing them so that I can keep myself and my partner safe. So it's a very fine line, but it, it has to be well balanced. Yeah, there's such a combination of, and I'm going to try to wrap around a lot of themes that we're talking about. So we're talking about fear and we're also talking about not thinking worst case scenario and playing by that book, right? Not playing by that game plan. And some people listening might be like, no, I got to think for which case scenario. And maybe mm -hmm. we can meet in the middle because what we're saying is like, hey, if you take a domestic, which we know is categorically, statistically, extremely dangerous, right? You know, you can walk up on a domestic and get shot at. So we bear with that in mind. If you take the most cautious approach, then on every domestic, you're not going to walk up. You're going to get armor, right? You're going to call in the team. You're going to surround and call out no, that's not, that would be the extreme, right? You got to know that eventually you got to get out of your patrol car and walk up to that door and knock on it, right? But how you do that, there's so many ways to mitigate the risks and do it practically, safely, efficiently, effectively based on the context you have, right? But to, to Mark's point, you know, play it as it lays is you have some things you hear, some things you see as you're walking up, and then you might quickly adapt to take option B, option C, okay, let's call in this resource, or actually, I'm not going to knock on the door. I'm going to stand here and listen for a little bit, and then I'm going to peek around the back just to roll it all together. And then, you know, Seb, like you're saying, fear is a factor. And then it also makes me think about bias, right? We're talking about leadership and keeping people accountable, and we could call it the halo effect for those guys that you're like, oh, they're always doing solid work. But we got to be fair to them and the team when they're messing up, right? At the same time, everyone knows that you're going to have those people that you work with there. If you say their name or see their face, you're like, what did he do now, right? And that's not fair either, right? But it's, uh, it's some pattern recognition where you're forming a stereotype. But we need to be cognizant of that, right? These implicit biases to the point of you making the point, Seb, about meeting someone, right? You're keying in on something. Maybe it's similarity. Maybe it's similarity to someone that really violated trust, right? Really hurt you in the past. It might be something about their voice or how they carry themselves or their face. And yeah, we just got to be aware of that because it does intersect and interplay with all these things we're talking about. It teaches you to be introspective, which is what's lacking in policing, in my opinion, especially on the leadership side. And when I say leadership, I don't mean rank leadership necessarily. I mean leadership of everyone, because everybody's a leader in policing. And so I think that speaks volume to that concept. So uh, speaking of bias, I think it's super important for our leadership of how, how we treat people. Like, and so I, I helped in a bit of a leadership role within our medic profile for about five years. And I would always ask myself, how would I treat someone different in the same situation? Because there were guys in the medic profile that were like some of my best friends. And then at times there were people who maybe, you know, would cause a few more challenges for you. And I'd always ask myself, would I do the same thing if it was person A, person B, person C? And I need to treat everyone the same. Like in a way, I get leadership's different. Everyone needs to be treated differently in some ways. But truly, they need to feel like they're being treated fairly either way, regardless of any kind of bias. And that you treat everyone in a way where they're being treated with respect and they'll come out of it feeling like they've been treated fairly. I'd like to add to that a bit. One of the things I really like to do with my problematics, not that I ever had problematics in the, in the context of the team, but outside the team, I definitely have. And I do believe that treating people to the level of the potential is, is a critical piece. When people are responsabilized, you, you will be amazed how they can live up to a certain moniker, but give them give them the impression or the perception that they have a low bar to get up to, they will absolutely satisfy you and go to the lowest possible point and have the lowest sort of uh, performance, so to speak. But really start treating them at the level at which you know they're capable of and let them know that. Don't make it a secret. This is not an ambush. I know you can take this on. I just valued something now, even if that person has a tracking history of not so greatness, and I'm not going to give them something catastrophic where lives are at stakes or anything like that, but definitely something where risk can be managed. And you will be amazed how many of those people will come to. And I think that in policing, being such a cynical sort of environment and, and as a result of, you know, dealing with a 1% or 100% of the time and doing all this good stuff and forgetting how many good people are around, I think we have a tendency to write things off really, really quickly. Basically, one thing happened, you know, you've, you've had a poor showing. And this was my first exposure to you. I don't like how he works. I don't like it. 
this person is sick or whatever. And I, now I'm in the troll room and I'm bitching about them being sick, for example. And now I'm telling the, the next guy that, hey, this is what happens if you ever take some time off. This is what we do to each other, you know, kind of thing. And so all of those things are absolutely tied in, feeling valued, feeling respected, being treated to the level of our potential, being responsibilized. And even if we're imperfect, to be given perfect opportunities to improve and to believe that it can happen. And I know for some people, this is going to sound super idealist. And the bottom line is there are outliers out there that you can never change. We all know them, but trust me on this. There's a lot less of them that you think. There's a lot less of them. And so I think that as leaders, we need to be focusing on that. And you talk about leadership and parts of that are supervising and managing. You think about those problem employees, right? The problematics you call them. And one thing that you know, I started, and let's talk about idealistic things, because I want people listening on the podcast to hold those idealistic values that we say, because that might be actually something they can accomplish down the line, right? I want to treat it with that notion. So even going way back to the earlier, we talk about the scale that you introduced, like if this is zero to 100, and we go from zero to one, like that's a win, right? But we want to be shooting for 20, right? Maybe by the end of my career, maybe I can get whatever team I'm on or the general regional culture to like a 35, but hopefully we're talking about 100, you know, at least like 80, because maybe we can't even perceive 100 so that those listening in, they can really move that needle a lot farther in the direction it used to go. So a little tangent, but going back to supervising, one thing, and I think this is ego, and I want to know what you guys think, but new supervisor, it's almost categorical, right? Every new supervisor is like, oh, I got a project officer, right? I'm going to change him, right? I'm going to fix him because I'm going to take this different approach, right? I'm going to keep him accountable, but I'm going to show care and all these things. But I also overinvested. So I try to encourage my young leaders to not overinvest, not to say give up because to your point, a lot of people can change, but toggle your expectations, right? Maybe just move the bar a little bit. But then also the additional challenge I give them is, hey, it's really easy to overburden yourself, focusing like 80% of your effort to change that 10% of your team, that minute one point five percent improvement maybe toggle that to like your 10 percent underperformer maybe devote 10 percent of your time to them and that way you can focus on the rest of your team yeah it is but i would say this i'm, I'm gonna jump on here if we say that there is extreme v value in surrounding yourself with savages and being with like-minded individuals that are acting in a congruent fashion which is going to be conducive to you elevating your own game there is endless benefit in addressing your team in bringing that one person along the more of a safe space it is for them to act in all impunity, to be bitching about the organization, to be poisoning the sort of the watch culture on account of having a voice with everybody else, that's highly problematic. So what needs to happen is the person needs to grow at the same time, at the same rate or behind the team is growing. So there's constant pressure on them to elevate their, their service, right? But if they're given a safe haven from the other people on the team, for example, to be themselves and just kind of go ahead and poison the atmosphere, so to speak, then we have a problem. That's never going to fix itself because the environment around that person is has remained exactly the same. So there is no expectation of elevation. And so for me, I see you putting 10% of your time in these guys and 90% in your team like like a win-win anyways, because you're going to elevate the team, which in terms is going to put pressure on that person. Now, that person has two choices. They can get with the program and elevate ever so slightly or a lot, ideally a lot, or they bust out, right? Something happened. And if they bust out, that might be that they're not quitting the job. They might still be on the watch. But guess what? If you have 90% of your watch working and producing the way they should and having the right synergy in the right environment, that person isn't going to make a difference because I can guarantee you if they have that kind of attitude, they're probably not pulling a, a, you know, a whole bunch of work anyways. And so I see this as a, as a win-win. I don't think that I would be focused necessarily on this. And it's, it's a great advice to say, don't emotionally over-invest because definitely you have a lim limited bandwidth. Know that as the team is getting better, you're also helping that other person. To me, I think the connection part is really big. Like whether it's a problematic employee or a, a rock star, they want to know you care about them. And if they think you'll care about them, they'll go the extra mile. Like you, you will get more in the long term out of someone who thinks you care about them. And I've had great supervisors and terrible ones. And I've had moments when it's 3 a.m. and they're asking me, hey, can you stick around, stay late? And it's me or them. And I'm like, I just look at them like for a lot of the bosses I've ever had, I would do it. For you, I'm not doing it. It's because you you haven't earned my respect. You treat me terribly all the time. 
Like, why would I go out of my way to do something to do you the favor when you treat me terribly versus I've had other bosses. I'd do anything for them. I've canceled vacations to go to earth calls. Like I've literally, Hey, sorry. Like you got to go home. I'm going to this call like to my girlfriend and she gets up and leaves It's 5 AM because you know, we are going to go on a trip, but that's the stuff you'll do when you know that the people care about you. That's the kind of connection when you feel supported, you feel understood. So I think really getting to know them as people, getting to know their families, what makes them tick? It's not not just getting to know their work. Get to know them as a person. You do that and you will get a lot more out of the people in the long term and it'll be more of a win-win scenario. Man, you talked about an example clearly of that expectation support mechanism, right? You did what most people would say is way above expectations, right? That you're going to cancel a vacation that you planned because you felt the support was so so overwhelming and so positive that you're like, yeah, I, you got it, man. I'm there. You went above and beyond because the support sounds like it was above and beyond. I got to say on that one in particular, I used to go to everything. I was like a young single man. So I went, I worked constantly mm. and I finally booked a trip and my girlfriend had come over and it came in as a hostage rescue call that night. And a lot of stuff does, but then it isn't right. So mm-hmm. it like comes in like a super hot call. And I finally said no to a call. Like I wasn't on call. I didn't have to go. And it was 5 a.m. when they're like, we've been here all night. We still need more guys. And that's when you know your buddies need you. Because just a few times in my career, I've had the like, hey, man, we didn't have enough guys. And you're just like, it, it kind of kills you inside because you know your, your buddies were taking on some risk and you could have done something about it. But also at some point, you can't always be the one to carry everything. And, and personally, I did. I always felt that I had to be there. Like I'd always go and eventually end up on stress leave. And that was a part of it. It was part of the burnout of just constantly working. And now I I have a very different boundary that I got two young kids. They're my priority. Yeah, I I still love work. I do a good job at work. I do my best, but I also can't always let work win. I have to put them first now. And I just, sorry, I can't come in on overtime sometimes. It's just, it's just the new reality. And I think we're better for the long term and ultimately better cops if we can set those boundaries and be healthy people first. If you're toggling burnout, then you're not going to show up at home well, and you're definitely not going to show up at work well. Right. So we talk about if it's the resource, if it's the product being the officer, then we have to invest in that. Again, that's that redlining that we we're talking about earlier where we have to invest in our people. We have to support our people or else they won't be around to do this job long as they would like, as long as the organization or the community would like. So no, I think that's 100 percent, man. There's a lot of things with establishing boundaries that I think we do poorly as as cops. And it's it's actually a compliment to our character, you know, as far as wanting to help and wanting to be there and wanting to do the job. And so that's complimentary. What isn't is the problem that we're experiencing organizationally generally are directly linked to what we take on that we shouldn't take on that we end up doing anyways. And now it becomes a, well, look, you guys have done it and you ran 50% shorter, you know, and you still managed to do it. So you guys can handle it. Well, the reality is have we said, no, this isn't happening, then it becomes an organizational problem. And now pressure is being put in the right spots, which brings me to my next point. If you're a leader or if you have a lot of power and you have a lot of buy-in over your team, this doesn't take as something you can sit back and just kind of take for granted. This is power responsibility now, the responsibility that you have to not ever abuse that power and use it for righteous purposes is, is a critical piece of this. And one of those pieces is for you to say, say no before you ask people to do certain things for you, if that makes any sense. So I use my leadership capital to get my guys to, to, to accept to do certain things on account of what needed to be done. But if I started using that card to make them do all kinds of stupid stuff that I should be interfering with as a leader, I'm part of the issues and now I'm breaching their trust. And yeah, if nothing happens, we're good. But if something happens, that's gone forever and now potentially with someone, right? Because we know how catastrophic consequences can be in, in our world. It's a critical piece here. We have to manage. And a part of that is to have the tough conversations and to bring the heat sometimes to higher echelon or some management or whatever the case may be, the mayor for all I care, depending what position you're in and what ability to influence you have. And so this is something that as leaders is often overlooked. How much heat am I willing to take to help my people? Hey, Seb, can I jump in on that? Yeah. While you were saying that, it actually reminded me of a story. And it's the one Eric and I had actually talked about that kind of got this whole ball rolling. I'm glad you said Uh, that because I would have done the same thing. Like the reason why we're having this conversation is around a story very much in that vein. So yeah, please continue, man. 
You cool if I share that story, obviously, Seb? Uh, I'm not sure which one, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, you're about to find out then. There was actually a guy who was arrestable for murder. Maybe it was temp murder, but pretty high risk. Bad, bad dude, right? And we had done everything properly. So like containment, uh, barricade protocols, all that kind of stuff. Done everything. Now we're ready to use chem munitions. And the person's going to be gassed out of the residence. And the, the CIC was fairly new and would not allow it. And you recognize this is a problem. I don't know if you recall the call I'm talking about now on top yep, of your head. I do. But I was there that day. And I remember you recognize this problem. You're trying to overcome it. And then you realize, okay, what do I do? I'm being asked to ask one of my guys to go do something that I know is not safe and truly inverts the safety priorities. I think you would have understood that at the time. And so this only time I've actually seen it, but you as the TL went up and breached the door. And I remember I was your cover that day. I went up with you and it was this like bad fatal funnel basement, like a cement funnel. Like it was not a good spot. And I remember you did these like flying crossovers down some stairs and you smoked this door in one hit and then we all beat it out of there. And, and it got resolved safely but it's it's interesting because i actually had a lot of respect for how you did it and at the end of the day like truly i don't think it was the perfect answer and i don't say that to put you down the perfect answer was time out there's no urgency let's talk more i think what you did was way better than the alternative which is hey mark go ram that door not that i was a breacher because <laughs> you took on the risk instead of one of your guys because you knew what you're being asked to do was was not the right idea that story really stuck with me that's probably five years ago or more but that to me was, was a real sense of leadership and even understanding, like we often get told to do something. Well, that's not the right thing, but the person telling us doesn't know. So there's an educating up the chain of command, but that's hard to happen in real time when tactical things are happening and delays matter. I think it's a sign of your leadership and you're, you're leading from the front. Bro, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've gone over that call quite a few times in my life. And of course, as an introspector, one of the things that I should bank on or should have banked on was to develop myself even more in having the ability to articulate what I'm asking for into reverse onus on the commanders so that they would feel the pressure of not making the right call. And I was already doing that. But I believe that in that very case, there was such a visceral sort of reaction to what we were asking to do, which was very simple and grounded in fallacy. You know, it was really hard to overcome that emotional reaction of the person that was in the chair for the first time and not really having that experience. And we, you know, again, this being time sensitive, we didn't really have time to sort of have that super extended conversation as time was unfolding and on the call, which means inside the house and whatever was going on in there. And so definitely wouldn't recommend what I did as far as detaching myself from the team. Clearly, I had strong two ICs, but I shouldn't have not the best thing to do, you know, as, as a leader, but the worst thing to do for me would have been to send one of my guys. And so the point I was making wasn't to the boys or to management or to anybody. It was a point that I demonstrated myself. This is the leader you are. I didn't try to influence, you know, them or reverse a certain onus on the management if something did happen to me or if whatever. But two things, A, I wasn't going to live with one of my guys getting hurt when I knew that this was an unwinnable scenario in those circumstances. But also, I just, it needed to happen is the bottom line, right? So what are you doing if it needs to happen and you don't have the tools to make it happen and you're stuck between? And, and the longer you stay on target, the more risk you're taking on. And so at some point, uh, sort of a decision has to be made or else you're inverting the priorities of life. I, I agree with what you're saying, though, because mm -hmm. we can't look back and expect us to have made perfect decisions throughout. And that's not just tactical situations. That's in an investigation. That's in all kinds of things. Waiting for full information. Often you've waited too long. So sometimes you do need to make a decision and good on you for making one good on you for prioritizing the safety of the guys on the team. Uh, and don't take it that as a negative at all. But uh, I think it's just a, an example of, like you say, if we'd waited five more hours, we're, we're taking on risk just standing there. So it's really, it was better to get it done than it was to sit there forever wondering what we're going to do. That's why after action is so crucial, right? And as the outsider that wasn't anywhere near there and just learning about the story more in detail here is that, you know, I hear several things. One, you are super introspective, which I mean is the highest compliment because when people say that about me, I'm like, oh, thanks. Cool. I'll keep working at it. You recognize it wasn't ideal, but you also recognize the context and the timing. And there's so many lessons that you've internalized and you are refocusing on, but there's hopefully lessons above. Certainly there were below, right? Mark's literally a guy years later that's like, yeah, this stuck with me. And he's brought it up multiple times and it's helped inform his leadership ideology and personal mantras and how you conduct leadership of service, right? At the same time, likely someone above, maybe not the direct that made the 
the call, but other people probably talked about it and were like, man, remember that when that happened? Like, we need to make sure that never happens. And maybe, luckily, nothing happened, right? That's extremely fortunate. We have to uh, count our blessings there. But I think that sometimes the goodness that you might not even intend or perceive at the time can manifest in all these different directions and levels of people, that ripple effect that comes out because it's the whole team saw that happen, right? And the whole command saw that happen. And it sat a lot of different ways with people probably as it happened and after that maybe weren't feeling a certain way when they made the call or were hearing the call. And then certainly, you know, Mark's peers and everyone that they continue to work with, like that becomes culture. And we're talking about culture, right? And that that becomes something you internalize and you make your own, you pay forward and you you pass on. I think it also spreads throughout the team, right? It's like Jocko talks about that with extreme ownership starts at the top but then when you do it then everyone does it and it's a hey we got a problem let's go deal with it like i'm gonna find a solution i'm gonna take action and do something about it and in a weird way i know you mentioned my book at the start but my book was my attempt to do something about a problem that i couldn't handle i would hear about police suicides i'd see so many people that needed help and weren't getting it and i said i'm gonna do what i can do i can't make the organization do anything and i'll just do whatever i can on my own because i want to do something about that problem and i think it's a similar just trying to take ownership. You see something, go fix it, right? And even one of my, my first TLs, his name was Rob on the team. And that's what he said, like find something on this team and make it better. And for me, my passion became the medic program, but there's everyone can find something that that's their thing. That's what they're good at. That's what they care about. And when we all do that, man, we all get so much better together. Yeah, and with the crossover of all of that, if everybody is invested in helping in the wellness department, then everybody should be taking something on in that context. What is it that you are personally doing? Because what happens in policing, and I, I alluded to earlier with the cynicism that turns into nihilism sometimes, is that we are looking to blame external things for everything that's happened and we fall in victimhood, right? And when we do that, it prevents us from using some of the, our capacity and abilities and and tools to build something that would be proud of, that will help all of us around. And so we became detached from the solution somehow, as if somehow somebody is going to come in there and fix everything about wellness problems inside the organization, when really it's an individual piece of work. Every single member, every person in that organization has a responsibility of wellness to themselves and others. So how do we make that happen and how do we take responsibility? If you're looking less externally as, as to who's not, n- not doing what for what, you start asking the right question, which is what am I doing to support wellness in the, in the workplace? Now you're, now you're onto something. And if everybody does that, just like if everybody trains hard enough so they can be the backup they need to be. What if everybody's hitting the mats or, or punching or doing whatever they need to do so that they're ready to be the person they need to be when the time comes? That speaks to people that go out and do the work on their own time so that they can you know, be the person they need to be when it matters. All of those things are not silos. They're completely interwoven. And it's a, a critical decision that has to be made. And it's a conscious decision. And it takes effort and it takes dedication and it takes time. But it's extremely worth it. That's setting the culture, Seb. That's yeah. what we need. And that takes years of change. Like, and each of us, as we interact in our sphere of influence, we influence people and it's a ripple effect, right? And I had a friend, he's a friend of mine, but who was ripping on someone who was off work publicly in front of everyone. And Seb, you mentioned about stigma earlier, um, it was probably half an hour ago. But um, that to me is where we address it. And it's just like, hey, man, we're not going to do that. And then you talk to him one on one after just like, hey, man, when you do that, everyone here is going to be like, no one's going to talk to talk about me like that. I'm never going off. And it's not the going off. It's the getting help. It's doing something about it. And how do we talk about it? How do we how do we even think about it? Right. And that's what how I've looked on in my own mind about stigma. It starts as our mental model. It starts as the message in our own brain. And then eventually it flows out into how we interact and speak with others, what we tolerate around us and how we treat other people, how we make them feel supported, make them feel cared for. Yeah, just building that better culture. Yeah, it's so huge. I mean, again, we're going to talk about idealistic notions, but they're true, right? So be the culture you want to see in your agency because you're going to have ripple effects. And anyone listening to this is you definitely are invested in self-development, team development, right? These things we talk about but where wellness, culture, leadership all intersect is what can you do about it, right? And the notion of stoicism, right, as you unpacked a bit of it, right? So those that hear it, and I even, I'm remiss because I had a recent episode with Dr. Brooke where she talked about stoic like faces, 
and I didn't unpack like, hey, we're not saying that's stoicism, not in that notion. Like we're talking about the philosophy, right? You know, acknowledge the moment, acknowledge the emotion. Don't let the emotions and other external forces change you. Recognize it, process it, metabolize it. Now you focus on what you can do for the situation. And if you can't change it, don't sweat it so much, right? Mm -hmm. And so as an officer, I was always like, man, Sarge won't do this. And the sergeants don't care about this and da, 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 da. I, man, how much I could have done as a peer, as a peer influencer, right? And we all were doing it at some level, right? And then I got to sergeant. And I'm like, man, command, 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 command. And then those in my team now listening are like, okay, he's about to make the excuse for command. Because as a sergeant, I remember directly a, an assistant chief at a sergeant's meeting said, hey, morale, culture, all these things that you guys are beating the drum week after week after week, that's your job. That is your job. And I took it the worst. But when I heard that, man, I was like so put off. In the delivery, I'll say maybe there was some opportunity for for improvement on the delivery, but he was right, right? It is a sergeant's job. It's everyone's job. And so I've tried to adapt that model and the, that message to expand upon that saying, hey, I hear you. Are you doing what you can? Cool. Thank you for passing on the message. Now I'm going to do what I can. And you just got to trust the process. You got to trust that. But then also in the meantime, if I can't change something concretely, like you just got to know that you're doing what you can and keep pushing that right challenge yourself to see maybe something that you wouldn't have even acknowledged is within your power maybe it is right maybe you can keep nudging that right those ripples can get bigger they can become waves and so that's what we got to focus on right like how much wasted bandwidth time stress on the things we can't change and it's huge for all of it myself right like i'm, I'm constantly worrying about all this stuff that's not really going to move the needle but if i can just repackage that and focus on what i can and this podcast is a part of that, right? Having these really meaningful conversations where literally I get so much from it and I know I get excited, you know, hearing all the feedback, right? And I get excited when I see the downloads and not to make it about the numbers, but I know that this is getting multiplied and magnified in a way just like other podcasts, right? It's not to say this is anything amazing, which it is, but um, <laughs> if you like this conversation, quick plug, if you like the pace of this conversation, it's like, this is what they do on the collective, like on the regular uh, they're doing it every day. So there's like just a host of conversations. Seb's on there a ton. Mark's been on there. I'm on there a few times. But just all these SMEs from all different walks I'm intersecting on just being better. But yeah, if you want to uh, get your brain melted a little bit, <laughs> tune into the collective. No, I like the concept you were talking about there, which is essentially your sphere of influence, right? And that's that's where that emotional investment investment has to be controlled. So I have my direct sphere of influence of things that I have immediate influence over and those things I should be worried about and I need to be conscious of them and I need to be putting in place actionable items so that I can, you know, reach the desired outcome there. But also there are things that I have a lot less influence over. So I'm going to do what I can. And if influence can be built upon that, I definitely will do that. But if it cannot, then I'm going to care only as much as I can on account of how much control I have, which is a lot less than if it's my direct sphere of influence. And then if there's something that's completely outside of my control, this is occurring at the, you know, at the chief level, if it's occurring at the government level or all of those things, I have zero bandwidth for that. Zero. I cannot. I cannot possibly optimize myself as a as a police officer, as a leader, as a as a member of the community by caring about certain things that I have zero influence over. Now, when the voting booth opens and, and there are certain things that now I have actionable items I can actually get in there. If there's a way for me to work my influence level up by all means, you know, if I decide to get involved in politics or do whatever, those are things that you, actions that you can take. But the danger is not to take action. The danger is to have the conversation endlessly, receive a dopamine hit from the fact that you've spoken about it and, and continue to do nothing only to proliferate it over the course of the next 10 years as nothing's changed. We need to be taking actions, deeds, not words, you know? Yeah, I love that, Seb. I think uh, your sphere of influence is huge. Understanding what you can control, what you can't. Um, that if, if we can get that across, that's a big part of cultural change too. Let go. You can't control what command staff is. There's lots of decisions that come in from up above that you disagree with. You know, argue internally, like use your logic, but then when you accept what you can't change, because trying to, trying to change what you can't change will drive you crazy. And I've lived some of that. Mm-hmm. It, it's more it's more importantly that the more you're trying to do that, the less you're optimizing the things you're already doing. 
So you're dropping two balls. There. It's, it's not like there's no value whatsoever in seeking that. But what are you going to drop on account? So it becomes a prioritization of life, so to speak, for me, right? If I have to use the bandwidth that I have to use to run my team and to respond to critical incidents, do all the stuff, then I'm going to need this bandwidth to do that. And I'm going to need to do to be able to optimize what I'm doing, even though there would be value in me pushing further on this. But because it's outside my sphere of influence for the moment, I'm going to focus where focus needs to be. Start spreading yourself thin and see how bad it goes and how fast. Yeah, it makes me think of this, like just exerting ourselves on these things that are unfruitful. And if we're honest with ourselves, and we're honest with the landscape, we're going to be like, okay, I'm not going to be able to change this person's mind. It might be a really influential leader, right? You might be thinking, as I did, as a newer consumer back when of Jocko, like, love the dude, love what he puts out, awesome stuff. However, there was the piece and he addressed it later when I kept listening of extreme ownership, where I heard that. And I was like, yeah, F yeah, like I was so inspired and empowered to be like hey it's on me and that's not what he means right he doesn't mean it's all on you but it is on what is in your sphere is on you what you can control is on you but this notion of leading up doesn't mean you can change everyone's mind it doesn't mean you should recognizing that that immovable object it becomes a fool's errand right so if we if we misappropriate our efforts and we do that stuff then we are wasting right like Am I going to try to push this rock, this boulder? I mean, a decently fit dude, but I'm, let's talk about like a, a thousand pound boulder uphill. Am I going to push that? No, like I should probably regroup. And if that is a goal down the line, then maybe I turn my effort towards helping other people, gaining some allies to go push that thing later, or maybe uh, saving up for like a, a bulldozer, right? Like working <laughs> smarter. And I think that that's, you know, dumb example I just came up with. But sometimes I think that, man, if I would have been if I could tell my younger self, man, like, are you trying to push a boulder uphill or do you want to go uh, regroup and learn how to drive a bulldozer? You can accomplish so much more with other people. We're so limited in what we can do individually. And especially for each of you, as you hit those leadership positions, you have such influence on such a large number of people that you can do way more than you could ever do by yourself. And that brings us to kind of a, a very interesting segue, which is the segue of everybody wants to complain about leadership and nobody wants to join it. So you don't have that right. It just simply doesn't work that way. Life doesn't. You don't get to complain about everything that somebody's doing and not be walking a mile in the shoes or at least trying to gain some general understanding. And that's key. And if there is a way for you to interfere with what they're doing on account of it's an elected official, those types of things, yeah, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about the regular things that you could be doing. It's such a thing where you talk about victimhood and we're bad at it a lot of times. Yeah. And I think our society plays into that and all these community things in our culture, right? Law enforcement culture, a lot of things intersect to make that really tough. But even when you said that, it made me think of, this is not one person, I've heard this in numerous agencies and a lot of people of this vein, right? Where they said, well, I tried, you know, I put my name in the hat or I tested for promotion and they didn't want me. So, you know, F it. And I mean, what victimhood, right? And mm. hey, I'm not saying politics isn't a thing. I'm not saying burn bridges isn't a thing. I'm just, I'm not saying that, you know, maybe you weren't the better person on the test day through these different processes. But it's just to say, when people say that, then they've resigned the fate and they've resigned their impact. Like there's a different way, right? It's not always up. Sometimes it's diagonally. Sometimes it's, you know, a lateral step. And then there's a bigger ladder there outside of the confines of what we paint. So that victimhood exists in so many different flavors and different different archetypes. And it, it becomes really frustrating. And I think that most people will recognize, you know, people listening in, they'll recognize how corrosive that can be. It, it absolutely can. And when it comes to the ownership piece, you know, just to kind of go back on this for a second, taking ownership is more about taking the, the driver's side seat instead of sitting in the passenger seat of a bus with a, with no driver in it. And now you're at the mercy of absolutely everything. So yes, sometimes I'll take ownership over things that I don't really have ownership from a fundamental standpoint on, but I will do it anyways, because it leaves no surprises there. You know, I'm able to deal with whatever it is that I take on. And so it's very empowering to take ownership of things. Unlike what people think, you know, I just, I just take blame for everything. No, that's not how this works. It's what it allows you to do as you're liberating your mind of that constantly need for external validation, of that constant need for maintaining a, an untouched ego, all of those things that are bringing you essentially to the comfort zone where nothing happens, where growth goes to die. That's such a good example. You're talking about being like the, the unwilling participant on the bus. And, you know, maybe you 
maybe you can overpower the bus driver, but you know, in an organization, probably not, right? But maybe the solution isn't just to be there complaining about you know the the upcoming crash, but maybe it's just tell everyone, hey, here's what we do if we crash, or here we're mm-hmm. in it together. There are there are ways we can sit. There are things that we can do to make sure that we're safer and that we can bounce out of this, right? That allegory is tricky, but you know, there's an example where years ago I felt like my agency was sinking and I kept calling it a sinking ship and I was going to a mentor and continually I was told, hey, your job isn't to stop the sinking. It's not to, you know, raise the ship. It's to focus on the treasure on the ship and guard that closely, right? And I was like, well, I think that's my people. He's like, okay, you know what you need to do. And I was like, isn't it to save the ship? He's like, no. And I just sat there and I was like trying to think and marinate. And it was like several weeks later when I went to talk to him again. And I was like, hey, I'm going to bring up that example again. I was like, so maybe my role is to, if this ship sinks, is to make sure that everyone knows where the lifeboats are, right? Every, that we can, you can kind of rebuild this own, you know, tie these little lifeboats together later. He's like, sure. Yeah, sounds good, man. And I don't know if he just kind of gave me that just to appease me, but, you know, I've revisited a couple of times, but I mean, th- that's true, right? We can feel so overwhelmed by this giant thing and whether the sinking ship is, you know, your workplace or whether it's the government and politics and the media and like society, like you're going to burn yourself up fast. And mm-hmm. I've, you know, I've, I've thought these things, you know, I've, I've, uh, catastrophized things or I've let the, the other catastrophes affect me negatively like it still happens right and that's why i try not to watch traditional news yeah we just gotta buckle back down and focus on what we can and i'll plug this too because we're talking so much about wellness and leadership and culture because i recently met with a bunch of wellness uh leaders and coordinators of different ranks civilian and sworn and all that so different dynamics in my region and what i was sitting there thinking about as people were talking about what's the best way how do we get the most movement i'm like man it's recognizing that all these people that care about wellness, whether they're quote unquote wellness people or just, you know, the the line officer, you are a leader in this, right? So if you want to improve wellness, and this is me thinking out loud from that earlier thought and the meeting was just the same leadership principles apply, right? Meet people where they are, be engaging, earn trust, like all these things that help quote unquote traditional leadership be effective apply that to wellness into culture and then you're going to get advancement and where you want to go. Yeah, I mean you you see people advance on 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 account of everybody else or drive everybody over the bus to make it up the the the, the quote unquote chain uh, but it doesn't last. Trust me on this, even at the executive level ranks, you'll you'll see eventually they hit the wall of all walls and it's over, right? There's there's just and I think we've spoke about this before uh, myself and uh, and you Eric I mean, it's it's what happens. But if you're doing it correctly, sometimes you'll take a few steps backwards, but you'll ultimately go with forward momentum and you're going to achieve all that you want to achieve, but you're going to do it in the right way, which is going to help others achieve preferable outcomes, not just you, because it's much bigger than us. Yeah, Eric, and to kind of bring it all back in together, uh, your analogy of the ship, we're talking about spheres of control. I would argue no one's in control of the ship. None of us can truly... <laughs> mm switch the ship, but we can all support each other and start plugging holes and making it better. And I think that is what our sphere of control is. And as we help those around us, that helps everyone and that gets the ship going. But it's realizing that none of us are actually able to do it alone. I love how that's come full circle. And I appreciate you guys so much for coming on. What would you like to leave the listeners with as we talk about all these big ideas, all these different conversations and where it intersects? What are the nuggets that you'd like people to focus most on as they go about their day, as they go about the rest of their year, and as they keep advancing themselves and their teams? Honestly, it's just that we can do it. It's a belief in a better future. Because sometimes we give up and take for granted that the current reality is what it's going to be. It's just the way it is. Oh yeah? Well then let's make a better future. And I think what each of you are doing in your own way is doing that. You are two of the leaders that are making that reality happen. So thank you for what you're doing. Thanks for letting me join you. You too, um, man. And, and it's a belief that we can get to that better future. And truly our mission is to accelerate the speed at which we get there, at which we make progress and get to a better place. And back to sphere of control, every one of us has some control. Anyone listening to this, you have control. You get some control in your culture, in whatever cultures you're in, whatever workplace, family, et cetera. And you get some say in where we get to. I mean, we need to stop the external projection of who's not doing what. 
for who and how and how we would or should or could. And it's about actions, taking actions, understanding that when you are discussing something with someone, your body gets a feel for, I just did that. And that was beneficial to whatever outcome would be preferable for me. But that's a lie. It's not the case. You haven't done anything. So in order for you to make things better for yourself and those around you, and in the long run, you know, the organization and the public at large, you need to be the optimized version of you. So you need to focus more of your energy on internal mechanisms than you do on external factors. And that is a difficult job. It's hard. It's not easy. It will affect your ego. It will, it will you know, make you uncomfortable. All of those things are necessary. Everything's hard. Pick the hard that makes you, your organization, and policing better. So much sagely advice from both of you. What I hear is get more uncomfortable. <laughs> Put that ego under the microscope. We know that we grow in discomfort and adversity. So recognize that, but be smart about where you apply that. Pick your battles, focus on you, stay positive, keep moving forward. I appreciate you guys. Love the conversation and I'm sure there'll be more. Awesome. Thanks for having us on, man. Great to yeah. connect with you guys. That was awesome, boys. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Blue Grit Radio. As always, support this community by subscribing, giving us a five-star review, and following, liking, and sharing posts on Blue Grit Wellness on Instagram. You can reach me there or email me at bluegritwellness at gmail.com. Be well and stay gritty.